Hi, I'm Seamless, and today is Monday, which normally doesn't mean anything, but today it's time for a new how to base, because I am not going to be here this week. And today I'm going to show you how to make this sound. One second, there it is. So, this looks an awful lot like it. everything is happening right here, but it ain't actually the case. Because there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here, and I'm actually using some analog modular hardware involved in this. To be clear, what's happening is that there is a harmer. It's going out. It's going into a filter where it is being FM'd on the filter. And I'm also controlling the filter. And then it's coming back in to be processed, uh, the, the new signal to be processed with all this stuff over here. So, let us begin. Do, 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 do. I apologize for the super ghetto screen capture that's happening right now, but uh, I came in, I, I literally got home today from somewhere and I'm going somewhere else in like three hours. So it's not gonna, just a bit of a rush. Anyway, so the first thing that's happening is that there is this harmer. This is working on some old techniques that I developed that I call the phase verb, where we are using, utilizing the detune uh, feature inside Harmer to cause phase cancellation that gives us a, this reasoning ability. The smooth sound beneath that is being created, and by smooth I mean it does, it's not progressing. It's not like normal normal unison changes where it just keeps getting you know farther and farther away. That's because the unison, this unison uh, pitch thickness uh, fader is being automated to cut off real fast. If it wasn't doing that, that's what it would sound like. Um, beyond that, I'm also controlling uh, the unison pitch thickness across the harmonics. This is saying that the, these harmonics in the middle have more uh, unison depth than the rest of the harmonics, which is causing some imbalance, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm boosting the lower harmonic, the fundamental tone, so that there's more bass presence in the distortion, which causes that particular kind of rounded feeling that we just experienced there. I also altered the harmonic phase um, position where I made a line type, uh, the wave line type, and then I just put it across the whole spectrum and just moved it around until I thought it sounded cool. In order to get the detune right, you can see here I'm actually using not just like the one or two, I'm using four, and then the two divider, what's up with that? Well, a certain thing happens when you do it in a normal detuning, where if I were to do like something like this, it would accomplish the phase cancellation, but it would also sound out of tune, because when, when it plays the note, it's actually changing and moving the... Um, harmonics like the every other harmonic except for the fundamental and because you're moving 99.9 .9 of all the harmonics it just sounds like you're moving the note so what i wanted to do was i actually wanted to set it up in such a way that the fundamental tone is actually lower and then the rest of the harmonics are at least in the correct starting position they're not in the, they're not in perfect harmonic sync but they're just close enough that it sounds like it is and just far enough that it causes the bass cancellations to the way that we like it oh breathing so what i've done is I set up I set up the divider to be up at two, which is just saying that's literally the same as what it was before. It's it's like if you simplify a fraction, two out of two over two is one over one. That's what that is. And so now when I go up a whole bunch, I go down the same amount, which moves the fundamental down and moves everything else down in such a way that it still sounds like it's right, it's correctly in pitch. Um and then I'm also going up to four here. So what this means is that I'm actually doubling the ratio, which gives us the square harmonic series. And this also means that I have to do double this. So for that to equal six of the two, I have to go on 12 on the four. If that didn't make any sense, I apologize. But if you try to do this yourself, you'll see what that means. Um, so then, yes, that's why this is up at this is up one and this is uh, down 0.5 to make it the correct pitch. You really don't need to do that if you don't care. But um, because this is going, this is going to go get FM'd by something that's the same pitch. I want it to actually be I accurately itself, and then it's distorted, and that's the sound. So this sound is going out. It's going out of the system through eight at one and eight, and I'm doing this using these two pieces of hardware. Um, I'm. I'm basically the only really using the filter, but I am using, I'm utilizing this guy as a method by which to move signals out from FL into this thing. Um, so the FM signal is going out, or rather Harmer is going out seven and eight. So what's happening is that um, if I if I were being specific about it, I could have panned it and it would only go out because it's a stereo out. But it's right now it's going out both seven and eight. So I have linked eight to the audio input of the filter. 
That's what one of the cables is doing. And then after that, I have the bandpass out going into FL through my interface. So that's the bandpass out. Now, what's, very, what's really cool about this is that I didn't, I didn't notice about this filter when I first got it was that this has a low pass, high pass out, and there's not really a notch, but you can see there's a notch right there. And that's because a lot of filters will have a mix between a low pass and high pass. And if you get right in the middle of that mix, it phases in such a way that you get a notch in the middle, which is how you get notch filters. And even some filters who are, are still just high pass, low pass, you can even get bandpass out of that if you, if you reverse phases, if they have controls for that, that allow you to do that. And this is actually very important because if you're looking at filters and you're thinking to yourself, I want the full range of filtering options, you know, multi-mode, low pass, high pass, notch, bad pass, that kind of thing, then you think to yourself, wow, there's a whole lot of filters that are just low pass, high pass. And it's because you can get usually a notch at least or also a band pass out of a high pass and low pass configured filter, which is really cool. So um, band pass out going into the system and that's coming in here. Analog nine is the front, one of the front facing inputs on my interface. Um, so now here's this FM and CV1. What are these what are these guys? So the FM is coming out 8 out of 5 and 6, and that's actually a whole separate thing. It's one of these citrus channels. It's just a saw wave. This saw wave is coming out of, what is it coming out of? Number 2, I guess. Yeah, 8 out 5 and 6. So no, that's coming out 8 out 5. I don't think I panned it either, but um, it's coming out 8 out of 5. And it's going into CV2. So now CV in this instance refers to control voltage. And what that means is that it reads a level of voltage input and that determines the level of whatever parameter it's linked to. And pitch is also controlled by this in, in certain uh, analog synthesizers. And it's called the one volt per octave where a run one volt range is an octave range. And so if you, if you have that, like if you scan between the voltages, you get octave range. And then quantizers are, are pieces of hardware that um, output musical notes as opposed to smooth pitches and there's also lots of there's a lot of ways that you can tune uh the voltage outputs to trigger correct pitches even in, in the digital digital world there's even plugins that these guys make uh one called expert uh expert sleepers silent way which i've actually used already in a lot of the videos where i was messing around with uh, analog stuff but right now i'm not doing that i'm doing i'm not controlling the pitch with that because the signal i'm putting out from the citrus is just or is just playing the same midi as what i'm playing from the harmer so that i don't have to worry about any of that but it's going into CV2. Now, the reason why it's going into CV2 um, is not just because I'm also controlling CV1 with another Citrus, which is coming out, uh, this flat um, audio is coming out of uh, this guy, which is coming out 8 at 1 2. That's connecting um, uh, output to, yes, to the CVN. This just is directly controlling the bandpass cutoff filter. The bandpass actual like amount. That's what the, the frequency control. This is straight up automating that. And what the way I did that on the citrus, that citrus was that I made a square wave, and then I chose this half mode, which puts out a straight DC offset. This isn't a pitch, and it's not oscillating. It is a solid level that is staying on whenever it comes out. And when I, if I play it, you can see how it's when I, when I'm moving, I move, I'm moving the volume of that of this controller, and that level is being output uh, in terms of a peaking amount. This is like if you were to use the peak controller to control a parameter. This is essentially how every single thing in the modular world works. Everything is being peak controlled. So you have to condition the signal to actually be something that is, you know, like that what it wants, which is a, what, you know, this whole thing is for. But you don't necessarily need this. You don't necessarily need this ES3 thing. This, this is accepting an 8 at output, which is putting out eight channels of audio. If your audio interface is properly designed to output the right kind of signal, uh, which is called DC coupled, then um, you can just get an adapter for an eighth inch cable, put it in an output, and plug it into into one of these things, and it'll just do it. Um, I don't know much more about that. You just Google the term DC coupled audio interfaces, and you'll probably find a list somewhere of ones that work. Um, so yes. So now this automation clip is controlling uh, the CV1, which is controlling this guy. But now I've and I've entered the FM into CV2. This is important because what the CV2 does is is essentially a imposed motion on CV1. So CV1 moves the main frequency, and then CV2 moves like relative to that position. So it's an offset plus that position. And since I'm FMing it, um, it's going it's gonna essentially be like if this is moving around this way, it's adding an additional signal on top of that. And it will look it looks kind of like this if we were to, if we were to visualize that motion. So it's saying it's moving up and down, but then it's also the secondary motion applied to it. That 
uh, parameter is a positive and negative parameter. So it's a positive five minus five, which is so positive five in this exact instance means that this, the, the saw wave is coming out the way that it is right now in the, in the order or the direction that's going in. And then uh, if I come out negative, instead of coming starting at top and going down, it starts at down and goes up, which actually does have a very different uh, feel for it. So uh, let's sort of mess around with this with audibly for a second. Actually, before we do that, let's disable all of these. Oh, I did already. Oh. That's weird. Sure hope I had these on when I was uh, demonstrating this earlier. I don't think I did. It's kind of funny. Well, whatever. Anyway, if I commit to this saw wave and just play it really slowly. It just sounds like a normal LFO. And really, in the analog world, LFOs and the regular O's are all the same kind of thing. But back down in slow, slow land. Right now, I'm turning it towards the positive side. And if I turn towards the positive or the negative side, that whippiness is the reverse angle of this from the negative usage. So the the whippy side does sound more whippy, and then the other side sounds sharper. In the beginning, when I was just playing the sound and it seems like I was changing it, I was actually directly modulating that knob with just with my hands. That's this guy, the CV2 here. There's also the level in the resonance. This thing does distort a little bit. It comes out um, it comes out a little bit driven. I'm not doing that right now, though, because I don't want to clip it. And then there's the resonance control, which is actually down kind of low. Normally, when I'm using it um, without the FM, I have it. I actually have it on pretty high because the bandpass itself is very, it's very wide. And it's not all that thin when it comes to the high resonance levels. Yeah, so I'm just I'm taking this knob, I'm tweaking it around and moving it around, which changes the width of how hard the FM is applying itself. So smaller amounts, smaller amounts of FM, you know, look kind of like this, and the higher the higher the amounts, you know, that kind of deal. It's it's changing the range of the FM motion uh, relative to the motion of CV1. <laughs> and that's the magic that's happening here so the whole concept of all this is referred to as filter fm it's really just fm because it's being modulated by a frequency of something and the whole purpose of analog of all the stuff that you can do is that you can fm whatever the hell you want anything that has an input it can accept it's all the same kind of signal so that's why it's honestly why that's the thing about it that's not really easily done digitally or, or done at all, for that matter. Uh, there are some things that do. I recently discovered that uh, Yuhi, Yuhi, Yuhi Diva actually does do this, um, along with doing filter FM, but also does real FM. What I mean by that is that the uh, internal FM that it does, does so based on the actual shapes, like motion, as opposed to the change in slope in the shape, which is what normal digital FM does. It, it does definitely behave very differently. And then in the uh, filter FM side of it, it just does it straight up. And it does it for all the modes, unlike Massive, which only does the filter FM for the low pass and the high pass. Um, and that's an important distinction. And if Diva's uh, processing was a bit more modular, or her, her, then that would actually be far more powerful than it is now. And, and you know, to be doing this kind of stuff, to be doing this kind of filtering, filter FM in post, and like as easily as this, and you might be thinking to myself, I'm using hardware. How is this easier? Well, you notice that I can just put a note in there and it'll follow it. And that's the end of that. Like you can kind of automate filters. Like you even, even if like you can't, um, the LFO itself, like if I wanted to automate whatever the hell, just some parameter that's useless. All right. That's automate the phase of this thing. If I want to automate, like if I want to make it, make this an LFO, the LFO only goes so fast. That's not very fast. But if I wanted to go, if I want to be extreme, I can make like a line type of the waveform or the pulse, either of those, and then just 
Just really make it deep. Zoom in, make it deeper. And like that will go pretty freaking fast. The problem with this though is that this resolution isn't perfect. This is actually comes to down to a time resolution. It has to do with um, a setting called the PPQ. And to a lesser extent, the sample rate, but that's we're doing bass tones at the moment, so that means that like you really don't need to be worrying about 22.05 kilohertz FM. But this time-based business changes the resolution of you know the line types, that kind of thing. And higher time bases will allow you to zoom farther in, that kind of thing to actually actually see that. And now not only are you visually seeing it, but it's also gonna get processed differently. Um and Harmer, Harmer actually has a parameter about this that's referred to as the envelope granularity. Because while you might see smooth curves in envelopes and that kind of thing that you... That isn't actually an envelope, but like, and, a, and, a, and a thing that has an envelope, we see these smooth curves, it's not actually being represented as a smooth curve. It's being represented as something a bit more jagged than that. And um, this is definitely the case as well with internal automation like this. Some DAWs do it a bit differently. I'm told that um, FL's highest... Also, you might be thinking, oh, I can't go any lower than this, but you can also just... Whee. FL's highest PPQ is where uh, Mastering Da Sequoia's PPQ starts, and um, higher PPQ requires more CPU usage and that kind of thing and whatever. And no matter what you're going to do, though, the way, the, the, the way that the digital stuff is set up currently is not ever going to be as pure is what the analog stuff is doing which has always been the case and nobody's ever disputed that but for for motion for automation this is super important i'm not talking about weird like ephemeral analog warmth or whatever it full-on will not sound the same if you did this to a, a filter digitally versus just doing it to a filter and and something real like an analog filter um yeah so what's happening after that is that uh this eq is just sort of conditioning it to happen beneath the distortion I wanted more bass in there and then cut off some of these things so that th this is before the distortion. So this is sort of uh, pushing particular harmonics to be to, to be distorted more than others. Essentially, like you're pre-gaining, you're pre-gaining like the gained staging harmonic uh, uh, behavior before the, the distortion. And then I'm doing some more filtering. This is a pretty big bandpass. This is rather wide, so it's not you know, really, really sharp stuff like I normally do. And then I have this, which would have been a notch, but it's actually just a peak filter going down. And I'm automating how much it's going down and also its position. So here's the position, and then here's the level. I don't really know why I did that. I just wanted to see if it could be something that I did. And then this is the bandpass down here. And then I put in this convolver. This convolver has a small um, impulse response. And you get this by going into the impulses, small rooms, and that's just there. And that's because I wanted to add some stereo to it. And the stereo, stereo is hard in analog. Um, it's it works more or less the same way it does digital. We know the idea of having multiple versions, like unison and panning and that kind of thing. It's just that in the analog world, if you want multiple something, you have to actually have more than one of the thing. Uh, so it's um, a bit difficult to manage that. And also the signal splitting. Um, these are all mono input things in one in one out kind of thing like this filter if I want to have a stereo of this I'd have to have two of them um, which isn't like completely out of the realm of possibility for people who are really into doing modular stuff but I ain't there yet so mono it is um, but with this I'm able to sort of spread the stereo spread from the reverb <laughs> Just enough to have it give it like this air. This is kind of like imparting a room sound onto something, which is more or less what impulse, uh, impulse response based convolution reverb does. It's kind of sweet actually. And then compressed. A whole bunch of multi band limiting and then crushing on the master. And so when I play this sound, I am usually, I just tweak this knob, the CB2. Hit the play button.
endless amounts of fun with that. Um, I guess I can't really give you the FLP for this. <laughs> Wouldn't really make a lot of sense. Um, so if you absolutely want to try this without utilizing analog hardware to accomplish it, um, you would want to be doing what we did earlier with the automation up top uh, to of a filter. And just try and configure it in such a way. But like, your pain is going to be that like you can't really change the pitch of it. I guess you actually can change the pitch of it, and I think about it. But I don't know. What, I don't know what happens while you're doing it. It's it's weird. All of it trying to do that digitally is just going to be weird forever until someone figures out, or, or until CPU gets so ridiculously good that people don't need to care and they can just brute force it. And that's the end of that. But um, until then, you're largely left with um, specific offerings, internal solutions. For example, the Diva plugin, but also um, Circle Two is a plugin that does a little bit of uh, internal filter FM. But even that, you can also tell is a little bit odd. The way it's the way that it's impl imply implemented isn't really the same as what actual like literal filter FM does in the real world, and analog stuff. That's like for real. The filter FM and the FMing stuff is like the idea that you can FM anything, not just filters, but like literally whatever else. Like I ordered a, a unit that uh, it's called the Corgasmatron, and it's a, it's a dual filter, and you can FM the mix between the filters. You can FM the resonance level. You can FM. Like anything and like you just fm whatever the hell you want and you might be thinking to yourself what well, fm this fm that's everything whatever and just like a lot of the stuff like if you really don't even know what it could do which is uh, the draw to a lot of analog stuff for people is that like it's so uncontrollable i mean i'm gonna have some, some fun controlling it but i have to learn about it first and that is sort of like the that's like the thing that digital stuff can't do at least not very well so that's why I have the stuff. Anyway, if you have any questions about this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and all that good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.